Allen Lund Company, 47 years young and a proud sponsor, wishes OOIDA all the best as you celebrate 50 years. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. Higher oil prices mean higher prices at the pumps, and that's the forecast for the rest of the year. Landline Now's Ashley Blackford will speak with a senior marketing analyst with the U.S. Energy Information Administration about predictions in this month's short-term energy outlook. In an effort to unite the community of African-American women and women of color within the trucking industry, an association was formed. Ashley recently spoke with the president and co-founder of the African-American Women Trucking Association on how it got started and the importance of having representation in the industry. And finally, a coalition of two dozen trucking stakeholders is urging the House to move the Truck Parking Safety Improvement Act to the House floor for consideration. I'll find out what the letter says and why it's important from Bryce Mungin of OOIDA's Washington, D.C. office. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. Our top story today. The Truck Safety Coalition is calling for an investigation into whether U.S. Department of Transportation officials violated ethics rules regarding research on underride crashes. In a letter to the DOT Office of Inspector General, the coalition asked for a probe into possible, quote, misconduct and abuse that might have violated federal law when the DOT coordinated with lobbyists from the trucking industry to suppress taxpayer finance research on improving public safety in underwrite crashes with commercial freight trucks. Frontline and ProPublica reports led the Truck Safety Coalition to demand the investigation. In 2019 and 2020, Frontline and ProPublica reported that lobbyists for the American Trucking Associations directed DOT officials to censor any mention of the word regulation and struck entire sections of a draft of a government report about technology to prevent underwrite crashes. ATA has long opposed any attempts to mandate side underwrite guards. The owner-operator Independent Drivers Association, which represents small business truckers, also opposes regulations to require side underwrite guards due to operational concerns and the cost. The call for an investigation comes as the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is considering a mandate on side underwrite guards. The agency has said that such a mandate would save more than 17 lives and 69 serious injuries a year, while costing as much as $1.2 billion each year. The summer of the strike is spilling over into the fall. Nearly 13,000 workers at the big three U.S. automakers stopped work at midnight on Friday as their contracts expired, marking the first time in the union's 88-year history that it's walked out on all three companies at the same time. United Auto Workers represents nearly 150,000 auto workers. Not every worker is striking, though. This is a stand-up strike where not all union members walk out at once, not yet at least. The union members who have walked out are employed at the GM in Wentzville, Missouri, the Stellantis plant in Toledo, Ohio, and the Ford plant in Wayne, Michigan. UAW is demanding a 46 percent pay increase over the four-year duration of a new contract, as well as a 32-hour work week at 40-hour pay. The most recent offers from GM, Ford, and Stellantis fall well short of those requests. The terminal's trucks and trailers left behind after Yellow Corp folded will be auctioned off in the coming weeks and months. A bankruptcy court approved the timeline on Friday. The bid deadline for thousands of yellow trucks and tens of thousands of yellow trailers is October 13th. The auction is October 18th, and winners will be announced on October 23rd. Meanwhile, the bid deadline for Yellow's 169 terminals is November 9th, with an auction to follow November 28th if needed, and the announcement of a winner December 1st. Estes Express Lines has the latest and largest offer. It's offering $1.52 billion, besting Old Dominion's previous bid by about $25 million. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration is making $48 million in new grant funding available for CDL training. The majority of that total is going to states to operate national CDL programs. FMCSA said the money will help states expedite CDL issuance and renewals and ensure states electronically exchange conviction and disqualification data. More than $3 million will be used for a separate grant that's meant to train veterans and their family members, individuals from underserved and refugee communities, and others, something FMCSA said will diversify the pool of trained drivers. 
Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg will testify before the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee on Wednesday. The hearing is titled Oversight of the Department of Transportation's Policies and Programs. Details are scarce, but questions about the United Auto Workers strike and the Biden administration's electric vehicle policies are likely. We'll have full coverage of the secretary's testimony later this week. J.B. Hunt and BNSF Railway have struck a deal. The company has announced that J.B. Hunt is acquiring a portion of BNSF Logistics. When the deal is complete, J.B. Hunt will provide third-party logistics services for BNSF Railway. Terms of the agreement were not announced. Meanwhile, TFI International's tank truck network is expanding. The company said it has acquired tanker carrier Vetter Transportation Group. Terms of this deal were not announced either. British Columbia-based Vetter has more than 155 tractors and nearly 300 trailers, and it generates some $58 million in revenue each year. The acquisition allows TFI to expand its tank truck network from eastern Canada out to the west, where Vetter has operated since 1956. This is TFI's ninth acquisition this year. The Arizona Department of Transportation is asking the public to weigh in on Phoenix area speed limits. The stretch of Interstate 17 between the Interstate 10 split and Peoria Avenue is the focus. Right now, the speed limit there for that stretch of road is 55 miles an hour. A new law in Arizona calls for a minimum speed of 65 miles an hour on any interstate in counties with a population of 3 million or more people. But some exceptions can be made provided a study is conducted and officials open up the issue for public comment. Both are now happening. Feedback is being accepted through the end of this month. Goodyear has opened the nomination window for its Highway Hero Award. The annual award is set up for commercial truck drivers who have gone above and beyond the call of duty. Andrew Waits, a driver from Washington State, won last year for helping an unconscious motorcyclist. To celebrate its 125th anniversary, Goodyear said it's expanding the scope of the contest this year, honoring two winners picked from a wider pool of commercial drivers. Cash prizes as well as a prize package that includes a trip to New Orleans will be awarded. There are some eligibility requirements. You can check out more at landline.media. The nomination period is open through December 31st. National Truck Driver Appreciation Week is over, but the opportunity to save on fuel at Sheets locations nationwide is not. Sheets has extended its fuel discount through the end of the month. Customers get a $0.35 cent per gallon reduction in diesel prices and a $0.99 cent per gallon reduction in diesel exhaust fluid prices. And finally, insurance firm Nationwide has announced the finalists for its 2023 Hambone Award, which highlights the most unusual pet insurance claims of the year. And there are some doozies. This year's finalists include Giles, a New York cat who was closed into a folding couch, Josie, a California dog who ran into a set of metal bleachers while chasing a ball, and Sonny, a Labrador who managed to shimmy his crate five feet across a room so he could eat three phone charger cords. It's important to note here that all 12 finalists made full recoveries from their injuries, according to Nationwide. The Hambone Award, named in honor of a dog who ate an entire holiday ham while stuck in a refrigerator, highlights unique situations that pets find themselves in each year and calls on members of the public to vote for the strangest of the bunch. Voting for this year's award is open through Friday, September 22nd. The winners will be announced next week. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. Do you have a news tip or maybe you have a comment about something you heard on the air? Email us at landlinenow at ooida.com. If you'd like to join OOIDA, you can do it at a discount. Just call the membership department during business hours at 816-229-5791. You can join the association or renew your membership for two years for $50, a $40 discount. Next, Ashley Blackford reports on this month's short-term energy outlook, and we'll hear from the president and co-founder of the African American Women Trucking Association. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Firestone tires are for more of everything, more miles for every tire dollar, and more confidence in your fleet. At Firestone, we help fleet save with dependable value. Find your local Firestone dealer today at firestonetire.com dealer. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. 
For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. Landline Now, welcome back. Global oil inventories are expected to decline, causing oil prices to rise over the next few months. This comes from the U.S. Energy Information Administration Short-Term Energy Outlook. To discuss that in more detail, Jeff Barron joins me. He is the Senior Market Analyst with EIA. Jeff, can you walk me through what EIA just released about oil prices for the rest of 2023? Sure. So, right, we released our short-term energy outlook. We do that update every single month. And when we do those updates, we like to look at recent trends in world supply and demand of oil and petroleum products to help give us our base case forecast for oil prices. And some of the key determinants that go into our price forecast include the difference between world production and world consumption. And partially uh, as a result, partially as a result of Saudi Arabia's decision to um, extend its production cuts by 1 million barrels per day through the end of this year has really led us to observe or or estimate the production and consumption estimates that tell us that global inventories are going to be drawing. When global inventories are drawing, that generally indicates that in order to meet demand, you've got to pull from inventories that generally leads to higher prices or upward pressure on crude oil and petroleum product prices. So these supply cuts from OPEC Plus, and in particular Saudi Arabia, over the past several months have brought up crude oil prices uh, somewhere you know, around $15 per barrel or so since the middle of the summer. And again, that's, that's sort of leading us to, to believe that high fundamentals in the oil market are going to lead to higher crude oil prices. Now, you mentioned um, the cuts with OPEC um, with the oil production. Do we know why that is? Yeah, when they released these cut announcements, their main goal is they want to keep, you know, in their eyes, sort of world supply and demand balance. They don't want to see really big run-ups in inventories like what occurred during the pandemic, which when there was a big fall in demand, um, you know, they saw oil prices get extremely low. They saw global inventories build very rapidly. And they, you know, OPEC and by extension, OPEC Plus, because you know, they have other countries that are not formal members of OPEC, but they participate in these supply agreements, um, including Russia and Kazakhstan, for example, to keep their production levels relatively low, to, again, really try and um, target uh, a more balanced market in their eyes. Um, so that's really their stated goals for doing so. We're kind of in this level where, since the pandemic, recovery, supply and demand have been in balance for some quarters, but at other times, uh, on the whole, you know, demand has been recovering faster than world supply, and that's led to um, all those inventories really working off over the course of 2021 and 2022. That's contributed to higher prices, and again, where we're standing at today is that Saudi Arabia and other members of OPEC, they, they want to prevent, you know, inventories from growing if they see any type of signs of demand weakness. So we've seen over the summertime of concerns over Chinese economic growth, some of their recovery from their pandemic last year. And that has led a lot of these producers to say that it's, from a from our standpoint, we think it's better to cut production than risk having a, a recession or having a Chinese demand slowdown for the oil, the oil price and the oil market overall. And when it comes to these short-term energy outlooks, how do you come up with, with the information and the numbers for those? Yeah, it's, it's a process with, with several, several individuals on our team that contribute to this product. Now, obviously, it's more than just oil. We look at the United States, uh, natural gas, electricity, coal. So we try to take, a, a, at least in the United States, a fairly comprehensive look at total energy. When it comes to oil, we have sort of two separate teams or or individual groups of individuals that develop forecasts and estimates. So again, on the United States, we collect a lot of data and information. You know, we, we are the statistical agency for United States energy, but when it comes to the world, we rely on um, individual you know, history, historical data from countries or from the International Energy Agency. And when it comes to forecasts, 
We develop independent supply forecasts for these countries. So a lot of times it'll be looking at known projects that are coming online, and we have estimates of when those will come online and how much oil that'll bring to the market. So you add all those up, and that's how we come up with our world production estimate. Consumption is a, is a little bit trickier because when it comes to historical data, there's a lot less consistency and it's a little bit more challenging to get at, but we can still come up with some historical estimates. And we base our forecasts lar- for the future, you know, largely based off of um, expectations for GDP growth as well as our crude oil price outlook to see if GDP is growing at a certain percentage for this country or for the world, how, what's that going to mean for world oil consumption in this, in this particular country. And then we do that for several countries, several regions, and aggregate it up. So these two individual methods, when we combine them, it gives us an estimate of you know, how tight or loose the market is going to be, how much we're going to maybe build in oil inventories globally, how much is expected to be pulled from inventories, and that, again, feeds back um, into an iterative process that, that leads to our crude oil price forecast. What were some of the other highlights from the September short-term uh, energy outlook? Well, it, you know, it, certainly it depends on what market segment you're looking at. I think, for sure, as we already highlighted, um, very shortly before we published this, Saudi Arabia announced their production cut through the end of the year, so that led us to revise, revise up our price forecast for the fourth quarter of 2023. With respect to United States specifically, we revised down our gasoline consumption forecast. Part of that was, um, you know, one could argue it was sort of kind of a quirk in the data in the sense that we rely pretty heavily on population estimates from the Census Bureau. And they did some historical revisions, which, again, that gets baked into our forecast. They did some historical revisions on the share of the United States population that is uh, really the retirement age, 65 plus. So we had a higher share of that population segment following these revisions, which affects our estimate for how much driving uh, there will be in the United States. Obviously, if there's more higher, you know, higher share of retirees, less in the working force, less commuting, our forecast for driving activity declined. And that directly led to a decline in gasoline consumption. Um, So we now kind of expect a a slight decline in gasoline uh, consumption, excuse me, gasoline consumption in the United States in 2024. What, um, I I think you touched on some of these, but what are some of the things that are are driving up prices right now? If you're looking at just, you know, let's say crude oil, um, it's certainly highly related to to OPEC and, and OPEC plus keeping barrels off the market. One of the measures we look at is called spare capacity. If you're not familiar with that term, OPEC countries are not like Canada, Brazil, United States, non-OPEC countries. You can basically assume that the United States is always producing at 100% capacity. United States, Canada, you know, lots of several different producers, right? It's not one state-owned entity like Saudi Aramco or state-owned companies that manage the oil production. So you have dozens, if not hundreds of companies all producing more or less at their maximum. In OPEC countries, it's different. They voluntarily hold barrels off the market. So we have an estimate of how much they could produce versus how much they are producing. And the difference between that is spare production capacity. And right now in 2023, in our forecast, what we expect to continue throughout 2024, because they've announced they're going to keep barrels off the market, is that spare capacity is going to be somewhere in the vicinity of twice as high as it's past up. 10-year average. I have to double-check the numbers on that. But they're going to be holding more barrels off the market than they typically have. You know, they typically hold a certain amount of spare capacity, largely for reasons of in case there's an unplanned supply disruption. You know, OPEC wants to be able to fill in in case there's a a geopolitical disruption or a natural disaster. Really, this year and what we expect for next year is that they're going to maintain these production cuts in an effort to keep inventories where they are. And as a result, they're going to have very high levels of spare capacity. Now, with respect to petroleum product market, that's another story entirely, because obviously the biggest determinant of that is the crude oil price. And I just walked you through several fundamentals driving crude oil prices. But when it comes to petroleum product prices, gasoline and diesel fuel globally and in the United States, a lot of that has to do with tightness or looseness in refining capacity globally. And really, since the pandemic, there's been lots of closures of refineries globally and in the United States, that has affected the ability of refiners to produce enough fuels to meet the 
rebound in demand that we've witnessed since the pandemic. So that's led to really high crack spread. Crack spread is just the difference between the petroleum product price and the crude oil price. It's an estimate of how much uh, the, the profits of refining, if you will. So crack spreads are very high because refinery capacity is very tight and refinery utilization is very high. Now, we have had some capacity expansions in the United States and globally this year that have helped contribute to some lowering of the crack spread compared to 2022. But if you compare 2023, diesel crack spreads, jet fuel crack spreads, motor gasoline crack spreads, they're all much higher than they were before the pandemic. And we anticipate them to come down a little bit in 2024, but by historical standards, they're still going to be quite high. And yeah, just what you said there, when, if ever, do we do we think things will stabilize a bit? Well, I guess it depends on what exactly you mean, what time period you're looking at. I mean, seasonally, from a seasonal perspective, we would expect uh, gasoline prices in the United States to start to come down in the fall and into the winter time, which makes sense because there are differences in summer grade gasoline, more costly to manufacture summer grade gasoline at the higher demand period of the year. So prices are higher in the summer. And as we head into the fall, it just um, generally there's sort of seasonal downward pressure on gasoline prices. So we do expect gasoline to come down into the fall compared to where it has been, in, say, in August. Now, nonetheless, um, depending, again, it depends really a lot on which market you're looking at. I think for most fuels and, and really for even for crude oil next year, even though we do expect more or less balanced markets, we expect supply growth from that non-OPEC side, United States, Canada, Brazil, Guyana, to really add to world production. Demand growth is going to be a little bit weaker in 2024 than in 2023. So we actually expect crude oil prices to, you know, let's say they're, they're going to peak in Q4 of this year. Right? We expect that to reach a high of, you know, around 93 or so dollars a barrel, but eventually start to work its way down into the high 80s, ending, you know, we're looking at Brent crude oil, ending the year around $87 a barrel. That's because all these fundamentals where we're experiencing now, really tight markets start to loosen up a bit. Like I said, non-OPEC supply is going to really increase in 2024 and world consumption, we expect it to be, the growth to be a little bit slower than in 2023. So even with these OPEC cuts, supply is going to start to outpace demand at lower prices. And lastly, can you talk to me about um, U.S. oil production? It seems like it's kind of taken off in recent years. Is that helping keep prices down or, or not? Well, I mean, you can't attribute any one country's growth. I mean, it ha- it's all it's all relative to where demand is, where other suppliers are coming in. So certainly as the United States is adding production, that means more barrels are on the market. And if more barrels are on the market in a world of growing demand, that's going to have an effect on prices. But the United States is just one of several producers that are growing production that I've mentioned that I think are really critical to world supply growth, include Canada, Brazil, Guyana. Norway, you know, and even just other non-OPEC producers that have managed their declines. I mean, China is not like a big crude oil producer, but they have made investments to help slow their natural rates of decline. So that's just keeping, you know, all else equal, more barrels on the market than otherwise would be had they been able to decline naturally. A little bit of growth even out of Mexico, Argentina. So it all it all adds up, of course. Now, to your point, the United States is obviously a really large crude oil producer in the world. Increasingly, exports, crude oil exports have, have grown to record highs. And so the growth of the United States has been a major contributor to, to oil markets this past you know, decade plus. That was Jeff Barron with EIA talking about September's short-term energy outlook. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. Stay tuned for more after this. When you weigh on a CAT scale, you get a no excuses guarantee. You can now save time weighing by using your smartphone. Find out more at weighmytruck.com. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com, because your job is to drive, 
Our job is to help with everything else. Landline Now, welcome back. Its mission is to unite the community of African-American women and women of color within the trucking industry, all while providing a platform for development and resources. To talk to me about the African-American Women Trucking Association is co-founder and president Nikki Ward. She joins me now. Nikki, how did the association get started? Oh, man, we get this question time after time. And then I tell people, it was like, I, I, I envision myself as Martin Luther King. Uh, I woke up and I had a dream. And this is a true story. Um, you know, I, I got into trucking by accident. And I absolutely fell in love with trucking. And I've seen some of the pros and the cons um, of the industry. I also think it's an amazing, strong industry, one that's absolutely needed within, you know, America. My, I'm first generation American. And so I understand the importance of keeping the supply chain going and how it helps sustain, you know, America. Trucking makes the world go round. And so to see something so important, not have certain value placed on it really bothered me. Um, it also was familiar to me. Um, as I came from another male-dominated industry, I was a former executive for 18 plus years um, as an insurance uh, adjuster executive, and so I started from the bottom. Is what I can say, and I don't like to say that's the bottom, but you know, as far as the front line, um, I started as the front line on the phones, and then worked my way up to climbing roofs. And so, I, I this, you know, coming to trucking in an environment where people didn't necessarily look like you. Um, and don't always support you coming into the industry just that, like deja vu. And I'm like, you know what? Let's do it again. And how, what got you into trucking? Great question. So um, after spending 18 years in insurance, um, I, I actually was in a relationship with a trucker. Uh, he had about 20 trucks and his business just was not doing well. Um, coming from the executive the insurance executive space, um, I understand the importance of putting certain policies in place, certain procedures, and, and you know, it's a certain structure to ensure that your business is successful. And I saw that he didn't have that. And I found that to be very interesting for somebody to expand their business without certain procedures and practices in place, because that's not the world that I come from. So I, I, I fixed it. You know, I, I helped them. Um, and I saw the the benefit of putting certain practices in place, but I also saw some obstacles and it made me want to get involved. And so I accidentally fell into trucking um, is what I tell people, uh, but nothing happens by accident. Hmm. And are you still doing that? Oh, absolutely. Not with him though. No. <laughs> uh, so I was able to expand my fleet. So I, you know, we, we uh, my mother and myself, Mm -hmm. um, we went into business. My mother was my driver. My mother's also a, a trucker. Um, and I handled all the back end, the expansion, the logistics, the dispatching. Um, and so we became carriers and I, I took it up a step further and became a broker in this space. And so I, I we, we, you know, capital freight logistics, um, we were able to expand up to three freight, um, to, I'm sorry, to, to three vehicles. Um, so our fleet became, you know, started to expand and grow, but there was a lot of challenges um, that I faced along the way. And those challenges, I was not sure how to fix and how to handle as there was all this information that was provided and none of it was centralized and none of it was, you know, be, you know being regulated. It just is out there. And there was nobody to really say, hey, this is, this is great. This is good for you. Maybe this is, this is great, but not great for you. There wasn't anybody out there that, that I felt that uh, was able to provide me that information. And so I remember calling the FMCSA, and that's probably why I end up on their board. I probably called them 189,000 <laughs> times uh, just trying to get some clear direction. Um, and understanding of what was going on in trucking, mm. you know, just trying to understand where was the future of trucking going and why weren't certain things in place. And when the answer was, well, I don't know. You know what? I do know. I'm going to create the answer or force the industry to provide it. Mm -hmm. And so this is how African-American Women Trucking Association was born. It was born into somebody that entered into the industry during the pandemic and had a lot of time on her hands. And so with that being said, I'm a natural warrior. I wanted to fix injustices. I wanted to fix what was right. Was right. And I wanted to promote what was great. 
I wanted to make sure that there was a centralized location that was able to provide resources for women that look like me, for faces that look like me. I'm not saying there wasn't things that were out there, but there was nothing that was specifically out there for the demographic of women that I fall under. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, we, we, that, that's how this association was born. Um, it was born with a passion and a, and, and a need um, as well as a desire to make sure I'm able to see the next generation of women, and especially African-American women, that enter this industry feel supported. How many uh, members do you have? 4,000 members, and we have 34 affiliates. And so African-American Women Trucking Association is made up of two sectors. Mm -hmm. And we have our members, which are African-American women looking to gain entry into trucking, transportation industry, and then the women that already exist in this space. And then we have our affiliate sector, which are members of the community that have joined African Auto, have joined African American Women Trucking Association to support the growth and development of the industry that we are bringing in and welcoming with open arms. And what services uh, does the association offer? Uh, we offer so our affiliates. It's not us. It's also we offer a lot of support. Um, we offer. Um, different classes and, and lead ways to uh, different uh, scholarships and grants. We're also providing, um, we have our, our partnerships provide us access and uh, the ability to provide these services. So this is why I said we don't specifically offer these services, but we have partnered with our affiliates um, to make, to ensure that they are able to offer these services uh, to our members. Uh, and so one of our, our, for example, we have our education partner, our exclusive education partner affiliate, um, Zeta Trucking School, um, which has provided us um, an opportunity to grow uh, the transportation industry along, along, and align with our mission of increasing the representation of African-American women in the trucking space. And so with that being said, they have partnered with us and they have provided us 10 scholarships. Uh, to, 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 to allow these women to gain industry, um, I'm sorry, to gain entry into the trucking industry. And those scholarships consist of uh, trans, um, the, the hotel, um, the flight, a food per diem, as well as their trucking school for the next four to six weeks. And they've also uh, lowered tuition for women interested in, in uh, attending trucking school. Um, as well as for women that are already in this space and looking to, you know, obtain endorsements, hazmat, et cetera. And so we have come up with exclusive membership options uh, for, for these women that are in within the community to provide them additional services. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also partner with Rig on Wheels um, to provide a mentorship program. So we call that our driver development partner. Uh, and so they're able to assist these drivers that are entering within, within this industry and make sure that they have a clear pathway. Um, this, that whole mentorship and driver development has everything to do with the retention aspect. It's great that we are wanting women to come into this space, but it would be even better if they have a safe space and they are supported um, along their journey. And so we feel that will help with the ret retention aspect um, of the industry, especially as we are, you know, opening the floodgates and really, really promoting um, how this could change change your life. You know, this industry could change your life for the better chance, project you of your future, provide a future for your family. Um, and so we want to support that. So these are some of the services uh, that we align and partner with our affiliates to be able to offer as we are a centralized resource. Why is it so important for African-American women and women of color in trucking to come together and have a place to come together? Um, this is, is a layered question. And I'm going to answer it with all the layers. Um, the, the power of community, um, the power of unionship, um, the power of numbers, the strength in numbers. And so when we're able to come together as a community, we're greater, we're better, we're bigger, we're stronger. We're able to share resources. We're able to align um, with goals and, and uh, the future of trucking. We're able to see exactly where we are uh, as a community and then work to push forward within the, you know, with, with positive development. Um, we're able to angle differently because we're doing it with numbers and not just solely as an individual. We're able to invoke more change um, when these numbers, I'm sorry, we're able to invoke more change when we are able to come together 
and and figure out exactly where the problem lies and then actually figure out a solution to the problem, not just talk about it. I think that's one of, been one of the important uh, aspects of me being on the FMCSA uh, WOTAB uh, board is that we're able to collaborate and, and come together um, as association leaders and women uh, are leaders within the trucking industry and under and collaborate on ideas and talk about some of the things that we, we see within the transportation issue, um, uh, transportation industry that, that are issues um, that can be done better, um, that can create more safety for women uh, in trucking. And, and I feel like that is how you get things done. By putting, by putting women, you know, like-minded women um, that understand and are actually just not walking the walk, but talking the talk um, together just, just to kind of invoke change. Would you like to see more African-American and women of color in the industry? Absolutely. Hence the reason we exist. And we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that we do increase the representation of African-American women um, in the transportation space. Where, I mean, like you said, you're you're still a, a baby in, in, in the sense that, you know, <laughs> you've just gotten started. Where do you see this association in, say, five years? Oh, man, five years, 50 years, 500 years. We've cre- I've created something that's bigger than me. I've created something that will be here for our children's children's children. Um, as this was a dream that was almost picked up and supported um, by a former young lady, Gertrude Jackson, and I will never not say her name. This is a young lady who steps inside the transportation trucking space. And she was one of the few uh, African-American truck drivers that were on the road. She faced a lot of discrimination. She, you know, she, she was doubted. Uh, she received a lot of threats. She, she went through everything you can, you can go through um, to deter somebody from continuing their dreams. Um, and she, she moved forward and she did what she could to try to support women. And she created a Facebook group and that group was created in 2014. Um, unfortunately she died before I was able to meet her, but I felt her spirit and I found her Facebook group. It was called African-American women. And so when I found these African-American women in trucking, I said, wow, what's going on with this space? And I reached out to her family and then decided to pick up this woman's dream and keep it going. Her passions uh, were amazing, but it was bigger than passion. This is legacy setting. This is something that would change the trajectory of every woman's life that decides to enter this space and becomes a part of this community. So I turned what she just had as a passion into something that is able to actually be a centralized resource that can provide support for women that choose to enter this space, that can provide assistance uh, for their development and their growth within this space, as well as a sisterhood where they could feel, they could feel free, they could feel secure, and they could feel comfortable in this space to discuss some of the issues that they face being an African-American woman uh, in trucking. If any of our listeners are listening and they want some more information, where can they go for that? Well, we ask that we are actually on all social media platforms at AAWTA underscore org. And they can visit us on our website at www.aawta.org. Again, that's AAWTA.org. That was Nikki Ward, co founder and president of AAWTA. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackbird. Stay tuned for more after this. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877 878 5970 or go to prepass.com. Attention all truckers, Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I want to talk to you about those dreaded tax problems. I know you want to keep on trucking and not even think about them, but let's face it, they're not going away all on their own. You need professional help. I've been helping truckers put their tax problems in the rearview mirror for years. I can help you too. Call me now for a free consultation at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com. It's like I always say, keep your eyes on the road, I'll keep mine on the IRS. 888-557-4020. 
It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now. Welcome back. A group of trucking organizations is making yet another push to get a truck parking bill through Congress. Here to discuss the latest effort is Bryce Mungin of OOIDA's Washington, D.C. office. Bryce, how are you doing? Mark, I'm good. How are you? Very well. Very well. Um, Before we get too far into it here, just remind us, what is the bill in question and what would it do if passed? Yes. So H.R. 2367 is the Truck Parking Safety Improvement Act. And that's the legislation we've been working on for a number of years now that would allocate over $750 million for the construction and expansion of truck parking. So again, it's creating a program focused exclusively on truck parking. Uh, It's a bipartisan bill um, being led by Congressman Boss from Illinois. Uh, So this, this isn't a new bill, but, you know, we continue to slowly make progress on it. Now, there's a coalition that sent a letter, and and I'm wondering if you can start off by telling us who's in this coalition. What kinds of organizations are taking part in this uh, this particular effort? Yeah, and so what's important to highlight is this most recent coalition letter is building on the coalition that we've already had. So uh, previously, we and we continue to work with ATA uh, on this issue. We've been working with some uh, regional trucking associations like the Midwest Truckers Association. Uh, we've even been working in the past with the uh, brokers through the Transportation Intermediaries Association, or TIA, But this letter and the coalition now is broader than just trucking association. So uh, now on the letter, we have the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance, or CVSA, representing CMV law enforcement. We have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who holds a fair bit of sway in Washington, D.C. We also have the Teamsters uh, have signed on to the legislation, um, and also retailers. So the uh, trade association representing, uh, you know, retailers, stores, things like that. So uh, we're growing the group that's recognizing that this is important and urging Congress to act on the issue. What's the importance of having a coalition like that behind a letter uh, as opposed to just one organization? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things. Uh, The one thing that I always say when I'm talking to offices uh, is that you know, trucking issues are complicated and you pick any one issue and you'll usually find that, you know, you have OIDA over here, you have ATA over here, maybe you have the Teamsters over here, maybe the safety advocates are out there somewhere chiming in on the issue and, you know, you kind of have to figure out where everyone falls. But with this coalition on truck parking, we're saying we are all uh, – in this together. And, you know, you can go to an office and say, we are all behind this. You're not going to, uh, you're not going to cross any wires. You're not, or you're not going to make anyone upset by supporting this legislation. And the other thing that it's important for is that it helps to highlight the issue because while a lot of offices are familiar with uh, OOIDA and we've worked closely with a lot of offices, when you have you know, 435 members in the House, there's always going to be a few members we haven't really talked to yet, uh, whether that's because of the committee they've worked on or new member or what have you. But maybe they work closely with one of the groups that's in our coalition, or maybe uh, one of the groups that's in our coalition is really important to their district or state. And so that can be the deciding factor in getting them over the line to co-sponsor this bill or to speak out um, in favor of the bill so that it can finally get moved forward. So uh, coalitions are always really helpful. Uh, Again, it just kind of shows that there's buy-in from the industry and kind of other people who are affected by an issue more generally. Um, The letter addressed a number of things. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we can talk about some of the content of this letter. One of the things it addressed is the current state of truck parking. Uh, What did the letter have to say on that topic? Yeah, so it says what anyone who's listening already knows, but it's just that there are not enough truck parking spaces for the number of drivers that are out on the road right now. Um, And, you know, this is what we tell everybody. And I think the most um, tangible or visible uh, issue that people see when we're talking to staff and lawmakers is, you know, we ask them, have you ever seen a truck parked on a shoulder or parked on an exit ramp or something like that? And, you know, 95% of the time they have. um, And we tell them that's what the truck parking shortage looks like. And those are the dangerous situations that the truck parking shortage puts 
truckers in. So the letter, uh, you know, lays out the ways that uh, truckers face challenges uh, because of this shortage. Uh, it also uh, explains how this is something that has been well studied by states and by U.S. DOT. So we're well past the point where we need to do any more research to confirm there's a problem. One of the other things that uh, the letter talked about were some of the benefits that the uh, group of organizations contend that the bill would bring about. I'm wondering if you can go over what those benefits were in the letter. Yeah, so I'll just hit the highlights real quick and can talk about one or two more specifically, but uh, improved driver well-being, better driver recruitment and retention, uh, maximizing federal dollars, enhancing highway safety, economic prosperity, and reduced roadway congestion. So, you know, those are all of the benefits that we can expect to see from the Truck Parking Safety Improvement Act. Uh, I think one that's important, and because this is always something we talk about, you know, is there, you know, this alleged driver shortage, or is the problem really that the working conditions are difficult and it's a hard job, and so it's hard to keep people in the job? When we're talking about truck parking, whether you believe it's a shortage or whether you believe it's retention, we know that providing more truck parking spaces will help to address the issue. It will make the job easier, it will make the job safer, and it will help to keep drivers in the industry. Um, I think another important uh, point in the letter, especially when you're trying to get buy-in from members of Congress, is that the legislation would maximize federal dollars um, because this legislation does allow for public-private partnerships. Importantly, it makes sure that there can't be any fees that are charged for parking, but lawmakers always like to hear about how, you know, how is something going to leverage federal dollars because, you know, there's some members certainly who are more fiscally conservative and so don't necessarily want to be doling out federal money for everything that everyone is asking for. But if you can show that there's private industry buy in uh, that can help to uh, help to bring those members on board. Well, and of course, that also brings on board uh, truck stop operators who might yes. be the recipients of those funds. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's another really important group that we have uh, who has joined us on this letter is uh, NATSO or the, the association representing the private truck stop operators. Uh, that's one of the questions that we would get when talking to offices is, you know, this seems like it might be providing funding to truck stops is or sorry to like public rest areas, things like that. So the question is where the truck stops, private truck stops come down on this. So Having them on the letter helps alleviate those concerns, and again, uh, with the way that the legislation is structured, helps to get that buy-in from everybody. Uh, the bill has picked up some more co-sponsors recently in Congress. I'm wondering if you can tell us who some of the latest people are that have signed on to the bill there in the House and Senate. I think right now is a good time to highlight it is so important for you to contact your lawmakers, both in the House and and in the Senate, uh, because we're trying to move the bill through the Senate as well. And uh, the really the only way that's going to happen is if there's enough members who co-sponsor the bill and Senate leadership sees that there's enough support for this issue. So uh, again, can't stress it enough to, to call your representatives, call your senators, and tell them how important this is to support and address. Okay, well, we've run out of time, but Bryce, thank you very much for all the information about this issue. Yes, thank you. I've been talking with Bryce Mungin of OOIDA's Washington, D.C. office. And folks, if you do want to make your voice heard on this issue or any of the other issues we discuss here on the show, you should call your representative in the U.S. House and both of your U.S. senators. To call any member of Congress, all you have to do is dial up the U.S. Capitol switchboard. That phone number is 202 202- 224-3121. Provide the operator your zip code and they can connect you directly to the office of your senators and your U.S. congressman. Meanwhile, if you want to write a letter to your members of Congress or contact state lawmakers about an issue closer to home, you could do that through the website fightingfortruckers.com. Scroll down on the main page to where it says find officials and enter your zip code. The site will look up information for your federal and state lawmakers. You could also write a letter to them right there on the website. You can also get contact information by calling the membership department at OOIDA at 816-229-5791. That's our show. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media.
I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.